All right, there we go. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, thank you everyone for having me tonight. Um, my name is Hoi Ko. I'm an assistant professor at political science and international relations department. Uh, my present presentation today is about uh, public opinion in Kazakhstan. Uh, well, it sounds a pretty provocative title. Is there a xenophobia in Kazakhstan? So I use a, a, an experimental approach. So I found some evidence to share with you tonight from a leaked experiment. Okay, so let me just start with um, the next page. Okay, so the main research puzzle of this paper is public perception of China since China uh, has been rising as a global economic and political power. Uh, if I'm not incorrect, if I'm not wrong, I remember one survey conducted by the Pew Research Center uh, was about 2015, I guess. So they, use, uh, they do the global attitude survey every year, um, maybe quarterly basis. And in 2015, at some point, they reported that China for the first time was ranked on, on the first place for the question asking which country is, is the most influential uh, on the well-being of their own country. So China uh, rank uh, over uh, the US. So it seems that China was almost challenged the US hegemony, uh, at least at the public perception level. However, uh, that such perceived power of China uh, soon encountered many obstacles and most of which are right uh, uh, about the public perception. So people do not, well, they acknowledge China's increasing power, but they do not like China. And except for uh, some countries uh, that receiving a great amount of aid from China, most countries' public opinion or attitudes toward China is largely negative. And in the context of um, Central Asian countries, is so-called uh, the Chinese question. So because China's influence, uh, yes, China's influence is increasing and each country is in the regions uh, having much more dependence on China's uh, assistance, both uh, financially, economically, and politically. Uh, even for Kazakhstan, the largest economy in Central Asia, the strong relationship with China is indispensable. However, at the same time, uh, Central Asian countries wants to maintain independence and want to maintain certain distance from China. Well, this situation is roughly describing the so-called Chinese question in Central Asia. However, the situation of Kazakhstan is much more complicated. Well, especially when we consider that Kazakhstan emphasized its multi-vector multi diplomacy toward major powers, including China, it is now uh, seems like being forced to revise or discard this multivectorism. Um, and I'm going to explain why this is a critical question for Kazakhstan politics. Um, so previous studies show that the views of China are not in one voice in Kazakhstan, and this divergence is problem problematic since we often see there is a clear division uh, of abuse of China between the ruling group, uh, the ruling elites and the public. And I will, I will explain more on this in the next slide. Okay, so the bottom line is that the China is perceived as an important country for Kazakhstan's economy, security, and politics. And it has been believed that there were little room for ideological consideration in building relationship with China, because we need China to secure national borders and sometimes settle over some disputes um, and also to enlarge economic engagement for actual profit and economic interest, and also to gain some support at the international level uh, from China. It is also reported, however, that experts' views of China are mixed, but largely negative. Well, even for the, uh, the security reason, China is not viewed as a fully trustful security partner uh, for example, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is largely dormant and is not promising at all. And economic relationship is also sometimes uh, criticized and it's not as profitable as one might think. And China is basically exploiting the natural resources of Kazakhstan and do not provide sufficient incentives to, to native Kazakh companies and firms. 
And also at the cultural level, Chinese culture is not very welcome, especially when China aggressively promotes its traditional culture and Sino-centric worldviews uh, in foreign countries. Um, and moreover, uh, scholars point out that there are several sources for tension between uh, China and Kazakhstan. So uh, here are listed some of those sources. Uh, and those risks are not just a matter of public sentiments and feelings, but they could actually cause a critical risk to the political regime of Kazakhstan. So here is what I think uh, most critical issue. So given the contending views of China between the elites and the public, the authoritarian elites may have a dilemma over these Chinese pressure. While the elites need stronger and closer ties with China for boosting its economic performance, and which is also important for the uh, regime stability and legitimacy for authoritarian rule. However, the public distance about China may not allow elites to pursue such strong connections with China. And if that's the case, then this would have another negative impact on the economic performance, and which in turn uh, calls questions about the authoritarian uh, rule. So on this backdrop, uh, an empirical examination of Kazakhstan's public perception of China, especially in negative directions, could be a relevant issue for uh, domestic politics. Uh, another issue about public opinions in Kazakhstan is the lack of data, uh, if uh, you can find any. So excluding uh, Russian or Kazakh language uh, media, the public opinions of Kazakhstan are not well covered in academia and elsewhere. Uh, one of the exceptional data set I found was a Central Asia Barometer, uh, which is only a few data available out there about the public opinions of Central Asian countries. So um, I was able to download a previous data set of uh, the surveys conducted by the Central Asian Barometer. And here are some of the uh, uh, visual uh, representation of the key questions related to China. Okay, so the survey includes questions asking respondents a view of foreign countries, including China. And on the top left panel, uh, it shows that the positive views of China is pretty dominant in Kazakhstan, even though the percentage is declining over time. So the last survey I included in this presentation was it, uh, is uh, done in 2019 spring and shows the lowest points in terms of the percentage favoring view of China, but it is still above 50%. And more recent uh, waves uh, of the Central Asian Barometer Survey include questions specifically focused on the relationship with China. And those rest three panels indicate that positive opinions of China about China's investments and China uh, economic ties with China and uh, Chinese workers are dec decreasing in general. Um, but again, however, except for the questions about Chinese workers, the overall, overall sentiments towards cooperation with China looks pretty positive. And it seems that Kazakhstan people had some concerns about, uh, or about the inflow of Chinese workers and somehow equally divided perception about economic ties with China. However, the overall sentiment is still uh, the, the positive sentiment is, is, is of over 50%. So I do not see any particularly negative perception of China from those survey data. So the question is, is it really so? So studies of public opinions are largely relying on public surveys and polls. However, the main question of this study, which is about xenophobia, uh, could be troubled for two reasons. So when we conduct a survey, some questions are not sincerely answered because of the social uh, desirability uh, bias prevents uh, respondents from giving their true opinions and answers. And racial prejudice is one of the items that respondents often feel reluctant to answer. While it is also challenging that survey answers may be somehow self-censored because of the authoritarian government. Well, these both explanations can be applied to my question of xenophobia in Kazakhstan. It is about racial prejudice, which is normally considered a wrong behavior, and also is something going against the official position of the government. 
So I expect that our respondents may self-censor their answers and restraining uh, from answer uh, in the first place because xenophobia is a politically sensitive question. So to tackle this question, I designed and conducted a LIST experiment. The use of LIST experiment is in political science is pretty common and uh, becoming more advanced in, in, in terms of measuring public responses to sensitive questions. Uh, otherwise they may not be uh, truthfully uh, captured. A LIST experiment design is simple and it's also intuitive to understand. And recently more advanced design and statistical techniques and strategies are invented. Uh, one reason to review on least experiments confirm that there are actually response biases and those biases are varying in terms of a size and magnitude across different contexts. For example, over-reporting over of uh, past voting turnout is not as uh, strong as one might predicted before. But however, in other contexts, like questions about government in authoritarian states show that there are still significant response biases. So in my case, the question of xenophobia is not only a social desirability issue, but also related to the government policy. So I assume that respondents are likely to feel pressure to hide their true responses when they're asked about the relationship with China. So I use a simple standard count, uh, item count or experiment, at least experiment design. And my respondents are asked to answer in number of items they agree without naming exactly which item they do. So respondents in a control group are shown a short list usually containing three to four items and ask how many of those items cause negative feelings such as anger and irritation and so on. And they, they answer only in number not mentioning which item they felt so. On the other hand, the treatment group is shown the exact same items, but with one additional item. And this additional item is the one that researcher wants to measure. And then we take the difference between control and tri treatment group. And if the mean count of the treatment group is higher than the mean count of the control group, because everything else is controlled and randomized, then we can conclude that the, uh, the adding this, uh, the last items, the sensitive item causes or responsible for the increase of the mean count. Um, the design is simple and the analysis should be straightforward uh, only if these three assumptions are satisfied. The first assumption is random assignment of, tra of treatment. And the second, assi uh, second assumption is no design effect. So whether or not you are looking at uh, short list items or long list items, it doesn't change the way of your process that information, the way of, you th way of uh, your thinking about those items. So this uh, is uh, a, a, an important assumption. And the last assumption is, is no lies in responses. Well, to my knowledge, there is no statistical technique to quantify the probability of a lying in, in survey. So we simply have to assume it and that is the reason why we use uh, this list experiment design. Well, the, my experiment was embedded in the uh, NAC Analytica's omnibus survey. And the survey uses a nationally representative sample constructed from a registered household through a multi-stage sampling method. And the target sample size was a 3000. And in the particular survey for this experiment, um, I collected 3019 responses. And I created four uh, groups, including one control group, and uh, three treatment groups are given a different long list items, uh, which I will show you in the next slide. So this is the actual wordings of the survey question I used. So during the interview, the interviewer emphasized that the respondent should answer only using the number of items, not the specific item's name. And then, uh, the separate, uh, uh, and these four items are uh, not key items, which I, I use to, uh, to provoke that uh, negative feelings. So I use a separate sample uh, for the manipulation check. And these four items are all confirmed that causing negative feelings for Kazakhstan people on average. And these 
three are uh, the key items and the each group will receive one of these three items. So the first item is used to measure xenophobia and second item is used to measure the self-interest driven uh, negative feelings of China. And the last item is called nationalist item. I use it for uh, examine to test if the negative feelings of China is driven by this nationalist idea. Okay, so the survey was conducted again in 2019, August, and collected 3,019 responses. And the sample was divided into four groups as I designed, and each group is equally representative uh, sample of, of the population. And I, I checked the randomization, I checked the, the no design effect assumption, and both are satisfied. And I use mainly three different measures to analyze the data. The first is uh, difference in mean, and the second, I use a local average treatment effect uh, after blocking one of the demographic variables. And then uh, I use multiple variable, uh, variate models as suggested by the literature. Uh, for statistical packages, I use a Stata. Uh, Stata come, uh, has a user built package called KICT, which is a, a special package used for item count technique analysis. Okay, so. This is the first look of the data. The top table shows the mean count of each group. So if there is a xenophobia, the mean count of the xenophobia group should be higher than the mean count of the control group. So when I compare three treatment groups with the, against the control group, all three differences are significant as shown in the, in the table uh, bottom. So that means the Kazakhstan population have has the racial prejudice against the Chinese. And also because of people dislike Chinese workers in the country. And also they have concerns about China's increasing influence on the national economy. Well, since the treatment is randomly assigned, well, in other words, all the other confounding factors variables are already controlled. So you can uh, say that the result of finding here are confirmed even after controlling all the other social and demographic, demographic variables. Um, the next measure, I examined the local average treatment effect by blocking the data using one demographic factors uh, variable at, at a time. So I use uh, many different uh, demographic variables such as education, so whether or not the respondents receive college education, and also gender and age, uh, and also employment status, whether or not they are employed. But none of those variables are uh, are creating any significant effect except for two. The first one is ethnicity. So while both Kazakh and Russian ethnics answer positive to all sensitive items, xenophobia in Chinese workers and Chinese influence, the difference in difference is significant only for Kazakh in, ter in, uh, in their xenophobia item. The differential impact of uh, ethnicity on negative feelings of China is also significant for the nationalist item, but the direction is opposite between Kazakh and Russian. It means that Kazakh respondents are more inclined to say yes to the nationalist item compared to other ethnic groups, but Russians are less likely to say yes to that item compared to other ethnic groups. Uh, please note that these other ethnic groups include Kazakh when we look at Russian and also including Russian when we look at Kazakh. So this negative uh, coefficients for the, uh, the Russian difference and difference measure might be caused by uh, the, the Kazakh counterparts. Uh, the second variable is Oblast. So here is the figure uh, which is showing the 95% confidence interval of the difference between xenophobia group and the control group sorted in Oblast from the strongest to weakest. So as the bar moves away from the zero line, that indicates a higher, a higher chance of a xenophobia. And as you can see here, uh, some cities are significantly away from a zero line that, that indicate that, well, the xenophobia is confirmed. But some uh, of last, some cities are uh, overlapping with a uh, zero line. So we do not have a strong evidence of a xenophobia in that specific of last. So Shimkent, Atrao, Aktobe, Almaty, they are all uh, have a pretty strong chance of xenophobia. 
but uh, North Kurdistan or Karaganda or Kostanai, they are not. Okay. So lastly, this table shows the result of a multivariate models. Um, each column shows different estimators. So the first one is linear least to square, and second one is logit model, and the last one is maximum likelihood um, estimator, uh, as, as suggested by uh, Imai. Um, again, the ethnicity, uh, Kazakh in particular, uh, matters. A quick interpretation of this coefficient for the first column, the linear model is this. So on average, Kazakh respondents are more likely to have xenophobia than other ethnic minorities by 53.7% uh, points. And that's the, the most easy and intuitive interpretation. But the problem is the linear model sometimes produce nonsensical figures when we uh, compute the actual uh, chance or uh, percentages of saying yes to the sensitive item. So the next two uh, model, nonlinear uh, or maximum MLE uh, are preferred in terms of computing the probability of uh, saying yes to xenophobia item. Okay. So I'm going to show you how uh, the more substantive interpretation of those two models in, in a few slides later. So the next table is the same multivariate models for the self-interest, so Chinese workers item. So here I found no significant and strong marginal effect of the key variables, except for a very weak effect of Kazakh ethnicity. So the ethnic or other demographic variables uh, other ethnic and other demographic variables do not seem uh, change these negative attitudes toward Chinese workers. In other words, relatively speaking, the ethnocentric xenophobic attitudes are not well pronounced when it comes to Chinese immigrant issues uh, on average. Um, here, the last table is again the multivariate models using the nationalist item about Chinese influence. So again, the Kazakh ethnicity shows strong and robust effect on the increase of the mean count, uh, but uh, the counterparts, Russian ethnicity and other demographic uh, factors fail to pass the threshold. So this indicates that while well, this nationalist item, uh, uh, nationalism is kind of a uh, possible uh, uh, driving forces of this xenophobia in Kazakhstan. Um, so here is uh, the predicted probabilities that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, when we when we use these nonlinear models, the coefficients are not uh, directly interpreted. So I compute the uh, pr probabilities using this nonlinear model. Okay. So each row represents a hypothetical person in Kazakhstan, and that person's predicted probability of saying yes to those uh, sensitive items or having negative perception of China. So the first two um, scenarios show that the, the, the probability of xenophobia uh, for two hypothetical persons, uh, both are identical. They are single unemployed male living in an urban area aged between 36 and 45 and receiving no college education, but they are only different in terms of ethnicity. So the first person is a Kazakh and the second person is a Russian. And then the probability of xenophobic attitude is much higher for Kazakh, and the difference is pretty large and, and sometimes even larger than double in, in, in the items like a xenophobia and a nationalist item. Uh, for, comparison, uh, for comparison, I use different scenarios. So here are the three, uh, third and fourth row show the same probabilities, but with a different scenarios. So they are all uh, single Kazakh male uh, receiving no uh, college education, living in urban area and, and same age group, but the one is employed and the other one is unemployed. And in this case, uh, the probability is higher for un unemployed Kazakh person, uh, but the difference is compared to the, the above comparison, uh, the difference is pretty much uh, smaller. So the effect of employment status is much weaker than the impact of ethnicity, especially being Kazakh. So this is uh, uh, 
one way to uh, to emphasize the the, the effect of um, Kazakh ethnicity on uh, the xenophobia attitudes. Okay, so let me now summarize key findings. So first, there is xenophobia in Kazakhstan. So recall that the item I used in the experiment. So people express negative feelings just because a Chinese family moved to their next door. So this is is pretty commonly used a major way of asking uh, a xenophobic racial prejudice. And second, such racial prejudice varies only across ethnicity and region, but education, employment status, gender, age, they do not matter. And third, the antagonism toward China is mainly attributed to Kazakh people rather than Russian or other ethnic minorities in Kazakhstan. And such ethnocentric xenophobia is confirmed by other um, items like I, I use on uh, Chinese workers and Chinese influence. And fourth, in general, Kazakh people, Kazakhstan people show concerns about Chinese workers and increasing influence of China, but the ethnic uh, contribution uh, differs across Kazakh and Russian. So uh, if you recall previous slides, uh, the Russian ethnicity is not as a strong uh, contribution a contributor as a Kazakh ethnicity. And finally, um, xenophobic phenomenon among Kazakhstan public is largely driven by ethnocentric or ethnic nationalism, uh, not by uh, interest-based concerns. So uh, that's about the main findings of my research. And let me just uh, finish uh, with some possible directions from here. Uh, so for future study, um, I may, uh, I may focus on why ethnocentric xenophobia in Kazakhstan. Um, at the moment, I do not have clear hypothesis, so please share your thoughts. Um, so maybe another uh, explorative study uh, might be appropriate. So for example, uh, I should look for uh, what is the driving force behind this ethnocentric uh, uh, xenophobia. So maybe I need to, I need to look up uh, the, the exact narrative of, of China in Kazakhstan, so official and un unofficial. It might be some historical memories are, are uh, making people uh, less favoring China. So I need to figure out what historical memory actually contributed to that. Uh, or uh, because people hate China because of Chinese uh, the value is not compatible with the value of Kazakhstan people usually uh, uh, champions. So I don't know what is exactly uh, behind. So that is my uh, one possible direction. And a second direction is, well, I can compare xenophobia uh, of Kazakhstan people uh, with uh, people's view of other countries. So if there is a no such and an, uh, an, anti-Russian sentiments or anti-US sentiments, so what is the differentiation uh, between these two uh, or three views? Uh, if they are all same foreign countries and also have a, a pretty large amount of, of uh, contribution to the national economy, then what is actually differentiating their views of those countries? Um, and the last direction, uh, which I think I can do in relatively in short period of time is, so given this xenophobia, um, is it possible to use that anti-Chinese sentiments for political tools? So for example, I can test if uh, people can give more support for the government when government utilize this uh, xenophobic uh, attitudes of the public uh, in pursuing certain policies or uh, by framing certain issues uh, using this uh, anti-Chinese uh, sentiments, probably we can gain more support from the public. And then that may cause some potential risk to uh, the, co the, the elite coalition. So uh, maybe another experimental survey uh, could be possible uh, for, for testing uh, that possibility of political mobilization of xenophobia. Okay, so that is all uh, I have for presentation. And please uh, share your thoughts and then uh, I welcome any comments. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, for your presentation.
Um, so I can see we already have some hands popping up, but I just want to remind you if uh, you don't feel comfortable uh, speaking, feel free to enter uh, a question in the chat and, uh, and we will we'll try to, to balance. I can already see a number of questions popping up. Um, maybe we'll begin with one of the hands that are raised. Uh, Magjan, uh, do you want to, uh, uh, to ask your first question? Yeah, thank you, Professor Schmidt and Professor Ko. Thank you for your amazing presentation with those graphs and indexes. And my question is the following. Uh, in your presentation, you mostly compare Kazakh and Russian ethnicities, ethnicities, but were there any respondents of Uyghur ethnicity? And if yes, what was the index of xenophobia compared to Kazakh respondents? Was it higher or lower? Okay, so I can uh, I can answer the question quickly. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the data does not have uh, categories for other ethnic groups like Uyghur or Chinese uh, or Uzbek. So they only provide three categories for ethnicity: so Kazakh, Russian, and other. So uh, with the data in my hands, I cannot say anything about that. Thank you very much. Okay, and one more hand, uh, uh, Jani Beck. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kro. Uh, it was really interesting. And then I personally have been waiting for this uh, research you know, for, for two years, I guess, when you first mentioned doing this. And I think it's brilliant. I mean, I don't remember any other uh, papers on xenophobia utilizing this experimental design. There have been some um, works on anti-Americanism kind of using the experimental design. So I think it's, uh, kind of very much useful for, for contribution on this topic. So I have one question and maybe several comments if I may. Uh, so I don't want to take much time. The first question is, uh, I didn't really get your uh, division between xenophobia, self-interest and nationalist kind of thing. So I was a bit curious uh, how you define self-interest or nationalist and xenophobia. I mean, uh, I'm sure maybe you discussed this in the paper, but it wasn't clear, especially, especially the second, the, the last two ones. So self-interest, nationally, why this, uh, I mean, you use this concept so terms. So as for my comments, um, I mean, uh, the comments are related to your last slide. So, so for the direction for future research. Um, recently, I've completed a similar research on, on xenophobia, but uh, using qualitative data. Um, and then my respondents were um, graduates and students of Chinese universities. Uh, I mean, Kazakhstani graduates and students in, in Chinese universities. Um, and then I found a similar kind of uh, finding that despite that they are fluent in Chinese, that they spent five, 10 years in China, they are um, familiar with Chinese everyday life and, and Chinese culture uh, compared to this average uh, people in Kazakhstan, but still they admire Chinese economic development. They admire opportunities, economic opportunities that China creates in the country, I mean, in, in, in Kazakhstan. But at the same time, they still perceive China as a civilizational other. Uh, so, so there's very much this discourse that China is still other in terms of this values, culture, and all these kinds of, and this othering is not necessarily negative. I mean, there are both aspects, positive and negative othering. Uh, and, and this leads to, a, and also there's a kind of the perception that the China uh, um, represents some kind of threat to their own country, to Kazakhstan, but this threat perception is attributed not to China as such, but to, uh, I mean, it's caused by distrust in own government. So basically this is more about, it's not about China being hostile as such, but it's more about Kazakhstani government being unable to manage uh, the relationship with big um, uh, China, right? So uh, this seems to be kind of very interesting um, uh, kind of uh, findings to me. Uh, so, yeah, and then last point that you mentioned this, uh, to what extent this can be uh, used, the uh, anti-Chinese sentiments can be used uh, for political purposes. There have been uh, some um, studies recently uh, published uh, saying that um, oppositional forces, at least in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, use this China uh, threat kind of um, narrative 
as a mobilization um, to, 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 as a mobilization tool. And so where I can share the, the paper. So, and then there, there have been a, recently a book by Edward Schott from Toronto, um, his work on symbolic anti-Americanism, where he argues that anti-Americanism is a kind of this empty signifier, which can be filled by different kinds of actors and framed in different ways. In that case, uh, in that sense, uh, anti-Americanism is also kind of a tool for mobilization utilized by different kind of actors, both uh, um, kind of pro-democratic pro or more traditional anti-American. Anti so in that case, I was just thinking whether these anti-Chinese sentiments can also be used a kind of uh, symbolic, let's say, uh, anti or symbolic xenophobia kind of thing. So generally, it's very interesting and it would be great to discuss the paper maybe at some point. Thank you very much, and it was very interesting. Uh, thank you, Johnny Bay, and well, I'm glad to see you tonight. Um, yes, so um, I really liked your comments and uh, regarding the first one. So, what is the difference between the those three items I use for the long list uh, questions? Um, initially, I was using only one of uh, one uh, one one uh, treatment group, so xenophobia item. Uh, but I also also I was also uh, uh, curious about what is the, the the reason of this xenophobia. So uh, it might be related to ethnic nationalism. Um, so that's why I included these two items, uh, even though I have to sacrifice the sample size per group. Um, so the second one about the Chinese workers, so immigrant workers. Um, I rely on the literature on the uh, public attitudes toward immigrant immigrants. So they are largely explaining uh, either they are care about losing their jobs because of the intensive labor market competition, or they are care about losing uh, their benefits they are earning from the government or local government because of they are much more uh, uh, well. Uh, there are more uh, workers uh, that are going to take that uh, pie. So the size of a pie is limited. So uh, they are less likely to get the equal amount of a benefit they used to have because of the increased workers. They're usually low skilled and, and low income. Okay, so either way, it is about uh, losing my job or losing my benefit. So it's a, I, 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 I call it self-interest driven uh, negative feelings toward China. So that's, I, that's how I want to differentiate between uh, the second and third item. Uh, in terms of the with relation, to, with, uh, relation to the first item, uh, I think I, well, I, uh, I do not know the, the pro, uh, better, better way. Uh, uh, probably next time I should revise it. So given this is xenophobia, so people who say yes to the xenophobia, then probably I will ask this second and third item. Um, but in that case, uh, they have to reveal uh, their actual preferences for this sensitive item. So I cannot make that happen. So I simply just parallel these three uh, treatment groups. And then I use, I rely on theoretical accounts for you know, what is the differentiation between three groups, three items, and I use it. Um, for your suggestions, yeah, is, it is really interesting. Um, if there is really a significant impact that people's perception of Kazakhstan government and Kazakhstan government relation with China is actually causing or contributing to the xenophobic attitudes. So, um, yeah, please share uh, uh, whatever uh, you have, uh, you, you read or you, you know, conducted. So share it with me. So probably we can, uh, I can be more, uh, uh, aware of what is going on here. Um, so using qualitative data is, I think, uh, one way to supplement the findings I have here. Um, so probably I have to do some interviews or, or focus groups. Uh, I have done that before, so they might be a useful way. And about the third comments, yeah, I really uh, uh, excited to see that article or the book. Um, 
so political mobilization, I'm actually uh, talked to one of my colleagues in the department uh, and come up with idea that we can actually run a quick experiment. So giving this item with with this uh, anti-Chinese frame and the other item, again, anti-Russian frame and other item and no such frame, and then see how people actually you know, respond to this mobilization queue. Um, I know that uh, symbolic gestures and symbolic uh, uh, rhetorics are used for political uh, tools, but uh, what I, well, uh, I'm more like an empirical analysis type person. So I actually want to measure and, and observe how, how people actually respond to that kind of a mobilization uh, cues using this frame, different framing. Okay, thank you, Johnny. Um, uh Hoyun, would you uh, mind going to the chats? There is a number of, uh, of, of chats there. It may be easier if you um, mm -hmm. take a look at that and answer those questions. Okay. So um, Alicia, um, Sherry, Sherry has uh, done off, ask about the regional variation. Um, Yes, so um, I didn't actually run any test against different regions. Um, so this is all I have in terms of the regional variation. Uh, so probably I, well, I don't know how to categorize different oblasts and different cities. So uh, I was thinking maybe I can divide that into, you know, southern part and northern part and west and east. Uh, but however, after I seen this one, uh, it is not, you know, perfectly aligned to this, you know, north, south, and west, east division. So some uh, areas uh, in north have also xenophobia. Uh, I assume that, that the western uh, area has uh, more chance of a xenophobia because they, are, they may have a lot of Chinese workers uh, in the oil refineries and in, uh, in, in, in oil industries there. Uh, but uh, still, I'm not familiar with the context of Kazakhstan domestic uh, region. So probably um, I have to look more carefully in how it is. it can be divided. Uh, I think Alicia wants to yeah, say okay. something yes. here. Uh, yes, hello, Professor Cole. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I have a comment, mm -hmm. uh, but I see the pattern. Um, is that probably maybe um, should try to consider the um, distance from Chinese border from a region mm -hmm. and whether it affects the xenophobia. Because as I see here, you see Western Kazakhstan, Karagandi, Mangastav, Jambu, North mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, and Kosanai are quite distant from Chinese border, right? Uh, okay. In comparison to, uh, for instance, Shimkent and east Ka e eastern part of Kazakhstan, so probably yeah. this may help you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the suggestion. Um, so yeah, probably I I should put consideration that uh, the distance from China's border and also maybe uh, how many Chinese workers. If I can uh, if I can get the data on that, so how many Chinese workers are residing in the city or in the region. So probably that information may account for the differences across different regions. Okay. I think um, Lusaya, she raised her hands. Yes, uh, thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask if, uh, I'm sorry if I missed that, did your survey include uh, the question like uh, if the person he has actually interacted with a Chinese citizen or is his views uh, or are his views based off only on the rumors of his acquaintances? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have any other questions. So um, yeah, I, I, I expect that, well, contact theory may think that, well, if you have a more contact with the foreign person, then probably you have you know, more being positive because you have more chances to understand and interact with them. Um, so in the survey data I collected, um, I do not have that question. So uh, 
yeah, uh, maybe in, in, in the next uh, survey, I'll probably include that. Uh, one of the do you think it would make a big difference? I'm sorry for interrupting. Do you think it would make a big difference? Um, I'm not sure. So uh, the, the findings about uh, people's view of China uh, in other countries are pretty mixed as well. So depending on whether or not they have inter personal interaction with the Chinese, sometimes that has negative impact, sometimes that have a positive impact. Uh, so uh, one study I am familiar with is uh, public view of China in South Korea. So the younger generation who are believed to have more chances of and opportunities to interact with the Chinese because we have a lot of Chinese students in South Korea and they have a very, very negative view of China okay? oh. uh, compared, compared to the elders who do not interact with the Chinese persons as, as often as much as uh, the younger generations. So it really depends on context. It really depends on what type of interaction, but not, not just the quantity, but quality of interactions. So simple survey data may not be revealed the differences correctly. I see, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I have the next question. So I don't think that this common feature of Asian states to prefer European migrants to those coming. Okay, I mean, not only China. So, so I, I don't know if I can pronounce it, Kazakophobia, right? So Kazakophobia. Um, yes, I'm not uh, expertise uh, on this, you know, cultural studies or uh, uh, regional studies. Um, but yes, probably it's possible, but still, I don't think it's kind of a generalizable uh, arguments that, well, you know, the European migrants are more preferred over the Asian migrants. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So probably if, if you want to test it, uh, you can simply ask the different types of migrants, the origin of a migrant, uh, immigrants, and then uh, measure their attitudes. But unfortunately, I didn't do this one. Um, so yeah, I, I'm only focused on, uh, in terms of migration and attitude, I focus on the skill level, for example, and uh, what is the potential contribution of the immigration immigrants to the national economy or the local society communities. And that is, to my knowledge, is most relevant factor when they have forming uh, when they are forming their views of immigrants but not uh, just ethnic or or the origin countries so well, yeah maybe it, it matters okay uh, is it possible to make a research in a bigger scale given this is sensitive political questions may not be ready to, to support um so i'm not sure what you mean by in bigger scale um I mean the uh, number of participants, whether this uh, research can be can be studied uh, uh, in a bigger scale, like thousands of people. Okay, so the sample I use is three thousand nineteen respondents, uh, which is pretty uh, a, a nice sample size for. Uh, a national sample. And then, uh, but again, as I mentioned briefly earlier, because I have to divide the sample into four different groups. So I have to uh, uh, sacrifice the actual size per group. So the largest group is about 800 and the other groups are around 770, uh, 780. So that is not an uh, impressively large number, uh, but uh, still large, uh, still uh, sufficient enough to make uh, statistical inferences. Uh, if I can have a large sample, then yeah, it is always better. Yeah, Asel, I think she raised her hand. Uh, hello there. I'm sorry, I, I cannot use my image. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, the Kazakh case 
of negative attitudes towards uh, China um, or racism um, is participating in the global trend uh, and the global liberal critique of China um, and its um, standing in the world order. Um, and because this is the anti-Chinese sentiment is a, is a not only um, Central Asian phenomena, um, it's uh, being observed everywhere. Um, so, um, and if this is um, participating in this global uh, liberal um, attack on China, um, what would be the sources of the formation of negative attitudes in Kazakhstan. Maybe that uh, would involve some mass media analysis. Who would be responsible for generating um, such um, critique of China um, in a Kazakh mass media? Um, or like in Kyrgyzstan, I'm sorry, I'm Asel Dod Khidiva from uh, OEC Academy in Bishkek. I didn't present myself properly. And um, together with Amanda Wooden, I'm working on um, anti-Chinese sentiment in the um, uh, extractive industries in Kyrgyzstan. And um, it's very interesting how they, how local people in mining areas, uh, they form negative attitudes toward China. And uh, we're partly coming to conclusion that, that this is um, um, kind of uh, shared uh, um, attitudes, which are um, also vehicled in mass media, uh, both produced in, uh, in Western and Russian mass media. So maybe one way of looking um, for you in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Axel, and also joining from Kyrgyzstan. Um, well, I didn't expect that wider uh, audience ship tonight, but yeah, thank you for your comments as well. Uh, yes, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, the anti-Chinese sentiment is not limited to Kazakhstan. Um, it's everywhere, except for some countries uh, that are great uh, recipients of uh, uh, Chinese assistance. Um, in general, yes, uh, there are many studies already done uh, about anti-Chinese sentiments um, in Asian countries. Uh, the one I mentioned about South Korea, also in the US, in Australia. Uh, but yeah, um, it is more interesting to me because it kind of has uh, political context. So China is instrumental for the authoritarian rulers and regime of Kazakhstan. But at the same time, if the public dissent is, you know, growing, you know, more and more, then the 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 elite the winning coalition must do something about this. Otherwise, they may face uh, unpleasant situation. Um, so that being said, um, I think it's interesting to see uh, if there is a like a general uh, tendency of anti-China sentiments. But it turned out uh, from my data that well, it is not. Uh, general sentiments. It is limited to Kazakh ethnicity in, in within Kazakhstan. So, if if there is something uh, happening, uh, just like everywhere else in in the world, then all all ethnicities, including Russian, right. and people, right? So they have to show mm -hmm. their about this, you know, China's include increasing influence on Kazakh national uh, Kazakh uh, economy, but they don't. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's why I think this is an intriguing uh, question. So why Kazakh people? Why not Russia and Kazakh, but Kazakh Kazakh people? So that's mm -hmm. the one of the uh, the question that I can take away from the data. Great, thank you. Could you also uh, just um, provide the reference to your work? How can we cite you? For, I mean, for this particular study. Well, th this is not published manuscript yet, so. Uh, okay. So probably I can share uh, with you uh, as a working paper, okay? Sure, uh, thank yeah, you. But, you know, when it's published, then I will uh, post on where, wherever. So you can Google my name and then and then see if it's published. So I hope it's published soon enough. Okay, so uh, that's the one. So what is the participant seemingly xenophobic tendency stem from nationalist intentions? Nationalists would want to exclude interest of China's problem. Asking him if she wants to China person's neighbor. Lengths of nationalism. Okay. Um, 
Yes, so um, I think the question from Idos is uh, is some uh, related to um, one of the comments that I received earlier. So how can I connect this, this xenophobic item um, and to the, the rest of the two items? So, um, so I choose to use ex experimental design in the first place because I do not expect that people are you know, uh, honestly respond or answer to these questions. Um, so with that uh, limitations, probably it is still very challenging to connect you know, people. So if you have xenophobic you know, and then how this is you know, driven by how much of your anti-Chinese sentiment is driven by this uh, nationalism or ethnic nationalism uh, or uh, government. So um, I don't know, I have to sit down and think, so how can I design uh, an experiment to actually uh, tease out uh, the correlation between these two things? Um, thank for the suggestion and I think I have to work hard on that. Okay. Um, from Christina. So have you looked at the Russian Kazakh population in different oblast? So here is, okay. Um, so uh, when I use this uh, survey uh, sample, um, the survey, uh, the sample is equally dividing. So they use stratified sampling method. So each oblast, they uh, have uh, pretty much a similar uh, proportion of ethnicity, uh, which is a representative of the overall, not only oblast, but also the Kazakh uh, as a whole country. And besides, uh, because of I randomized uh, the treatment, so each group has uh, uh, nearly identical proportions okay, of the oblast and of the ethnicity and so on. So um, the effect of oblast uh, as I shown in this figure on screen now, um, is uh, you can consider that after controlling for the ethnicity. Okay, so that's the the, the one of the advantage of using uh, randomization. I think. So how did you collect the data? How much time? Um, so. Um, so as I explained, the survey, the experiment was embedded in, in a monthly survey conducted by NAC Analytica. So um, I, well, if you're asking me how long it take to get the data from the design, so it, I, I don't know, it's about a few months. So I designed ex, uh, the question and uh, experiments. Then uh, I have to translate into Russian and Kazakh. Um, so I use my assistants. And then uh, they filled the question in one of their uh, omnibus survey. Uh, so uh, after the survey was done, uh, and then everything else was pretty uh, in time. So I didn't take. I didn't think that uh, it take too too much time. Xenophobia is defined as a dislike for Chinese. Could it be the same? Sinophobia will manifest itself in only one. On us, for example, on the tour Chinese culture. Okay. Uh, yes, by definition, xenophobia is a racial uh, prejudice. So it's against the Chinese people. So I people do people with xenophobia uh, will have these negative feelings whenever they encounter or they, whenever their uh, uh, their life is connected to a Chinese. Uh, Again, um, the only finding that I have from this study is, this paper is, well, the Kazakh ethnicity is a something related to this one. So I don't know what is behind this. So that's one of my future research direction. Um, might be Chinese culture or might be, uh, well, the economically uh, manifested, probably that could be uh, partially explained by one of my uh, findings. So it's not self-interest driven because both Russia and Kazakh are indifferently, uh, indiscriminately have these concerns about, you know, uh, increasing number of Chinese workers. So it's not, you know, uh, economically driven, but it's more likely about ethnic or identity driven um, attitudes. Uh, okay. In the future research, it is possible to apply the same method to other countries. 
Um, yeah, so the least experiment is actually conducted in, in many other countries. Um, the one I recall as one of the most frequently cited is by Kuklinski, uh, which is asking about people's attitude toward African American, so in the US context. I think COVID-19 might increase the xenophobia, not only because of some, but a role, yes, okay. Um, yes, so COVID-19, uh, uh, most people, I don't know, maybe um, blame China for the spread of the pandemic situation. Um, so maybe that has some uh, impact on people's view of China. Um, so uh, in my data, it's, uh, uh, it's done in 2019 before the pandemic uh, broke out. So um, there's no way to measure that. So, and also I want to exclude that pot the potential impact of a pandemic. Uh, so uh, I think it's better uh, to look at the data before the pandemic. So that what is the actual uh, contribution of this uh, ethnic nationalism to xenophobia in Kazakhstan? Um, also, uh, adding to Christmas question, how did you choose people for research? Okay, so again, it's about sampling method. So this is a, a stratified random sampling. So the, the, the survey company, uses registered household, and then they construct their sample uh, in a best way to represent the entire population of Kazakhstan. So by oblast, by gender, age group, and also all different demographic factors are used to construct a representative sample. Okay. Um, and what is the operational definition of xenophobia? Okay. Well, yeah, I think I already answered that. Uh, what was the reaction toward China's less xenophobic in the northern number to seven? Okay, so I think I also answered it. So um, I don't know how to divide the entire country. Uh, so uh, maybe the southern and northern uh, division uh, might be applicable. Uh, so here, uh, northern part is compared to the southern cities uh, has uh, less chance of a xenophobia, but the southern parts are more likely to have xenophobia. But again, uh, some cities, some, some regions in the north also have some strong xenophobic uh, chances. So probably it's not clear cut uh, by just uh, geographical location, but uh, as someone already mentioned, maybe it is something related to the distance to the border or experience with the Chinese, uh, how many Chinese workers are residing in the oblast. Can education influence one's xenophobia? Uh, from my data, uh, no. So this is, uh, sorry. So this is, uh, uh, actually I run the analysis. So look at the, the, the impact of college education. So college education uh, does not actually differentiate Okay, so both college educated, college not educated, they both have uh, pretty roughly equal chance of a xenophobia and also uh, concerns about Chinese workers and the Chinese influence. So uh, again, education does not uh, change the xenophobic attitude. Okay. Um, so can you share the recorded video? Okay, so I think that's question for Brian, also consider the impact of the media. Uh, okay. Um, so media is, yes, as I think uh, someone mentioned, uh, a sale or someone, I, I, I forgot, sorry. So someone mentioned the media narrative or the context, actual contents of uh, how media uh, uh, portray China and Chinese people. So yeah, that matters. And also probably uh, depending on the age group, um, well, roughly uh, I can approximate, you know, the younger generation use, you know, more social media and, and westernized media sources, but the older generations are focusing on traditional mass media and also uh, Russian speaking or Kazakh speaking media. So that might have some uh, uh, chances of overlapping, but still the age group does not have Oops, here. So age group does not differentiate the impact 
on the social uh, on xenophobia attitude. So across all the age groups, you can see that they are equally uh, significant uh, in terms of their contribution to xenophobia. So age does not matter. And then based on that, probably the media uh, may not be the most significant uh, predictor of xenophobia. Uh, but I don't know, I don't have this media uh, variable in my data set. Um, so probably I can test it in the next uh, project. Using only survey, uh, not the true reason xenophobia in terms of interviews. Okay, so um, I think I mentioned that. So uh, you can uh, use uh, quality, more qualitative uh, data to contribute uh, to supplement the findings I have here. As for future research, um, I'm curious about the idea of reviewing historically the Kazakh view of China. Okay, how do you collect the data, the sample data? Okay. Um, uh, yes, so I am also, well, generally interested in uh, the field of study called the memory uh, studies. So uh, the memory, actually, historical memory has a, a very pretty large impact on people's perception, uh, uh, whether it's about China or about Russia and so on. So one way to, uh, to collect uh, such data is looking at uh, for example, uh, the education, so history textbooks. So in their textbook and in their official narratives, how they, how do they describe China or their past events with China? So that's one way I was thinking um, using as a more qualitative type uh, data for my future research. So uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that. Uh, so how the sample of individual were chosen? Yes, I think I answered this one. Uh, yes, uh, the survey was con uh, conducted uh, in the in-person interview fashion. So uh, the interviewer visited the house and then uh, the household, uh, some adults in the household uh, will come to and then take the questions uh, you know, in person. So it's not internet. Uh, how can we cite? Okay, I see. Uh, okay, so they're mixed ethnicity, uh, but unfortunately I don't have a more refined variable uh, for other ethnic groups. Okay. Um, interesting point of victims. Okay, so it's about the contact theory. Uh, it's also important. Okay, so yes, um, I'm looking at a question from uh, Murray uh, Mukhamed Khan. Um, so yes, uh, that's why uh, one of my possible future research is about comparing so people's view of China uh, with people's view of the US, people's view of Russia in Kazakhstan. So there are equally foreign countries, um, but it's not necessarily negative or as strongly negative as they do have uh, with respect to China. So uh, I don't know yet. So probably if we have a chance to compare that, probably uh, it's not simply xenophobia, or, uh, but more like a, a xenophobia in general. Um, but I assume that it might not be, okay? It may not just a general uh, negative feelings toward um, uh, foreign countries, but specifically China, okay? So yeah, probably I should have included one you know, additional item for a separate group. So uh, if they show any you know, negative feelings uh, for uh, a, a Dutch family moving to their next door. So we can compare that easily. So how difficult is it find conducting this research? Um, I don't know how difficult. Um, I don't know, but it's not, not that difficult, I say. Um, 
interaction with the Chinese will be, yes. So I think I mentioned this one. So the content and quality of the interaction matters. Um, people of Russian other ethnicity less likely to engage in national agenda. Okay. Uh, yes, so I think Amina Tasanova mentioned one of the unobservable confounding variable here. So probably uh, they do not pay much attention to national agenda like uh, uh, immigration or uh, national economy. Uh, so there are some possible different significant differences between uh, a Russian Kazakhstani citizen versus Kazakh Kazakhstani citizen who may have different levels of political interest or uh, concerns about their national economy in the first place. Um, so, uh, but again, uh, the one of benefits of using uh, randomization is I can assume that these two groups, control group and treatment groups are identical, um, but again, still there is chance that because this is unobservables, uh, so probably I should do some uh, robustness check um, using available variables. So these two uh, groups are identical um, also in terms of their uh, interest in national agenda. Okay. Okay, yes. Why include employment? Uh, why did I, <clears throat> excuse me. Why did I include this? Um, employment variable. Um, well, given this uh, impact of China in terms of, you know, uh, Chinese immigrant workers, so they may have think that they may think that, well, Chinese immigrants are taking my jobs. So if you are unemployed, then you're more likely to have this anti-Chinese sentiment compared to those who are actually have jobs now at the moment of this uh, survey. So that's why I include, include employment. And also that's kind of a general uh, uh, convention to include the employment status for uh, to control uh, demographic uh, factors. Um, again, the employment doesn't have any uh, significant, significant impact on the xenophobia. Okay, so Okay, religion could also be an indicator. So, um, okay, so yes, I consider that uh, the religion might have uh, something to say about this xenophobia uh, because uh, as the literature mentioned that, well, the Kazakh diaspora in China was uh, discriminated and also the Uyghur and, and somehow these religion and ethnicities are uh, interwoven in this uh, phenomenon of xenophobia. Um, again, uh, I don't have this religion variable in my data set. Uh, I don't know why they didn't provide me with that variable. Uh, probably I should ask them. Um, but again, uh, the ethnicity of Russian and Kazakh might be able to capture the religious division, um, but not necessarily. So um, I will take that uh, comment and then see if I can find a religious variable uh, from the survey company. Um, okay, so uh, I'm looking at the last comments from Ellen. Uh, the video recording will be available. So I think I covered all the questions on the chat and thank you for your patience, patience listening my uh, sometimes murmuring unclear speaking. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, are there any final questions? I see, uh, Diana, your hand is still raised. Was your, was your question answered in the, in the chat? Uh, no, I, I wanted to ask a new question. Oh, so okay. uh, do you think that there are advantages of having xenophobia in a country? So I'm sorry, I, I, the audio was a bit broken. So there is a, what, for xenophobia? Oh, okay. uh, do you think there are advantages for having xenophobia? 
Um, so this is a, well, well, personally, I don't think it's a good idea to have any kind of a phobia against a specific race or a national origin. Um, considering that the Kazakhstan government has been supporting and championing, you know, the harmonious of a multi-ethnic city in within the country. So this might be have some backlash as well. But however, in terms of uh, uh, the political elites, uh, this is, this may be a, a, a future problem uh, when they want to, you know, maintain strong ties with China. So rather than advantage, I see more, you know, potential problems uh, from this xenophobia, especially driven by this ethnocentric, you know, um, uh, considerations of China. Um, on this other hand, as I mentioned, oh, I see. I just wanted to. Uh... Yes. Ah, okay, so I wanted to add that uh, I think there is some kind of an advantage from having xenophobia mm -hmm. um, because like um, we can consider other examples of Chinese intervention uh, for uh, other countries like uh, that was in New Zealand where uh, uh, Chinese some uh, I don't know what was the number, but uh, some Chinese people um, just emer uh, immigrated to New Zealand and they bought a lot of um, houses so that after uh, a decade or so, um, the economic uh, status of New Zealand just was damaged so that uh, natives couldn't buy their houses um, with the uh, previous cost previous uh, cost, yeah. so it can be damaging for people in an economic way so mm -hmm. we can take this as an example and uh, consider this to take um, some new legislations so that even if Chinese people moved to Kazakhstan the uh, Kazakhstani people um, regardless of ethnicity or nation the Kazakhstani people can be uh, more safer in an economic way. Okay. So, so Kazakh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, as a Chinese investment, Chinese immigrants are somehow, well, not only damaging, but also somehow contributing to the economy. Is that your point? Because you mentioned that, well, uh, you mentioned the New Zealand case and it was damaging to the economy and to the native New Zealanders. Uh, they lose the opportunity to purchase their houses uh, at the previous yeah. you know, prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So um, I think uh, um, I covered it. Alexei, do you have comments? Yes, I have uh, two, two points. Uh, one point about the Central Asian barometer, I don't think it uses a random sample. So that's why maybe the difference uh, is with your study. Um, and the second point is about the difference between Kazakhs and Russians. Russians are more likely to watch Russian made uh, TV shows. Mm -hmm. And usually these Russian TV shows, they are have a very favorable view of China. So that's may be exposed to uh, pro-China propaganda on Russian TV. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that may uh, account for some, for some uh, uh, difference. Um, that's all, thanks, very interesting. Yeah, thank you, Alexei. Um, yeah, I remember, uh, um, one of the books about China, about, about the people's view of China in Kazakhstan that, well, it is somehow uh, learned during the Soviet time. So there is kind of a propaganda against China because, you know, Soviet, so, so Soviet Union and China tension, and then that remains in, in the people's memory of Kazakhstan uh, citizens after independence. 
Um, I'm not sure if, it, if it's still the case. So in that case, probably uh, Russian uh, people who are in Kazakhstan still have this you know, negative concept of China. Uh, they are learned, le learned during the Soviet time. Uh, but you mentioned that where Russian people watching the Russian TV uh, recent days, they have like flipped uh, opposite direction. So they are more favoring China. So yeah. that's interesting, yes. The, I mean, if you, if, if you are talking about the Soviet China relations, and uh, then it would be reflected in the age. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a key variable. So the older you are, the more you remember the Soviet-China standoff and contradictions and the conflict and tensions. And you would see it in the age uh, variable. And I think, uh, yeah, so that's, that would be uh, my point. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I will look into that. Okay. okay. All right, so uh, are there any final questions? Um, I think um, I think we've we've come to the end. Um, are there any remaining comments that, that need to be raised? If not, uh, this this lecture will be posted uh, as um, as Ellen mentioned, it'll be posted on the uh, the, the department's website or the YouTube channel. So um, I guess if, if that's it, then uh, please join us next week. We actually have a, a twofer this, uh, this month. Uh, Professor Sullivan has some uh, recent work on political transformation in Kazakhstan that's been published. So uh, we'll be uh, having another talk next Thursday. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, and uh, I hope I'll see many of you next, next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, bye.